This is a picture of Laura Simonson, a divorced mother of seven who went missing near her mother's home in Farmington, Minnesota in November of 2013. This is Jenny Gomez, a 19-year-old Oregon resident who went missing in 2012 while in the process of moving out of her state. Until mid-2014, the whereabouts of these two women were shrouded in mystery until a highway worker in a rural part of Wisconsin had come across two large suitcases lying in a ditch on the side of a road. The police were notified immediately, and upon opening the suitcases, the police had unearthed two bodies that were gruesomely decomposed. The bodies were mercilessly tied with rope, with the hands of one corpse being tied together, and the neck of the second body being completely tied, indicating strangulation as the lead cause of death for both victims. Simonson's body was accurately identified almost immediately through dental records, while Gomez's body was too badly deteriorated for any quick identification to take place, initially labeling her a Jane Doe. As a result, the authorities released this sketch to the public as a means to secure any identification from the public. The police sketch of the unidentified victim had circulated across the country with news stations revealing the sketch to their viewers. Rochester police have tentatively identified the second victim, but as we mentioned, they have not yet released her name. This is an artist's rendering of what authorities believe the second victim looked like. She's possibly white between the ages of 15 and 35, 5 feet 2 to 5 feet 4, and weighing between 120 and 140 pounds. She had long, straight, dark hair. She also had an overbite with crooked teeth two piercings in each ear, and a small heart tattoo on her abdomen. Eventually, the facial reconstruction sketch proved fruitful as Gomez's body was finally identified by her relatives, definitively confirming the corpse belonged to their daughter, who had gone missing just two years prior. Naturally, with two bodies now identified, the authorities inched closer to apprehending a suspect in the Grizzly case. That suspect came to be an ex-police officer from Wisconsin named Stephen Zelich, who was arrested on June 27, 2014. Zelich had met the two young women on SNM sites under the username Mr. Handcuffs, looking for submissive sex slave partners and had met each victim on separate occasions, with Gomez being killed a year before Simonson. The killings were done as a result of what Zelich had called breath play, in which he would strangle his victims at different moments in time throughout the sexual encounter. Realizing he had taken their lives, however, Zelich wasted little time stuffing the bodies into suitcases and hiding them in his home, only to subsequently discard the suitcases in a ditch on the side of a road, where they would later be found. He was sentenced to a total of 70 years imprisonment after pleading guilty to both murders. Zelich pleaded guilty to first-degree intentional homicide and to stuffing her body in a suitcase, then storing it in his refrigerator for a time, then in a suitcase, later discarded near Lake Geneva. But when looking into this case, you can't help but notice just how unsettling the police sketch is. It looks so disturbing and inhuman. The same can be said for other forensic facial reconstructions, though, where an artist tries to replicate how the murder victim might have looked like when they were alive, so that identification could be brought forward by members of the public who might have actually known the victim. So many of these reconstructions look deeply unsettling, which is actually the point. The depictions are meant to look as creepy as possible since that way it can stay in your head for much longer rather than the depictions looking more normal and mundane, which wouldn't make the reconstructions have that much of an impact in investigations. The theory is, the creepier they are, the more memorable they are, which makes it easier for members of the public to shed light on their identities as they are so distinctive looking and their features are greatly exaggerated. Without exaggerating the features, the reconstructions will look too plain and average, making the victim look like pretty much anybody you might come across in daily life, as opposed to a specific person you saw a couple months ago, or a long time ago. Case in point, since Gomez's body was so decomposed, the reconstruction looked very chipmunk-like, which does somewhat resemble Gomez's appearance when she was alive. However, forensic facial reconstructions and police sketches are by no means a new phenomenon. Take for example a sketch known as The Lion Lady, a 1980s police sketch illustrating the lifeless body of an unidentified woman found in Oklahoma, with powdered lime found all over her chest. The lime was utilized by the murderer in an effort to disintegrate the body to destroy evidence, but it only preserved the body through mummification. While The Lion Lady's body was found in 1980, it wasn't until January 2020, 
a whopping 40 years after for the mysterious Jane Doe to be positively identified as Tamara Lee Tigard, a veteran of the U.S. Army as proven by the fact that her dental records, provided by the military, confirmed the breakthrough in the case. Sadly, despite the positive identification, Tigard's parents passed away in the 2000s and her sister passed away in 2010. Her killer is still at large to this day. In another case, a group of children went out for a walk in Wayne Fitzgerald State Park in Ena, Illinois, when they stumbled upon a grisly discovery in a set of bushes in the park. The discovery was this decapitated head, with reddish-brown hair and a strikingly crooked neck, most likely as a result of an injury sustained from the murderer. Police hypothesized that the head might have been thrown out of a passing vehicle and into the park. Titled the Ena Jane Doe, it has been speculated that the head might have belonged to an Anna Lee Manning, who disappeared in neighboring Kentucky just a year before. But no solid evidence has been collected thus far to substantiate the connection, despite the mere coincidences. Still, in the world of police sketches and forensic facial reconstructions, not only are the victims the subject of recreations based on witness testimony and physical features, but the murderers and perpetrators themselves also claim a slew of unnerving police composites. This is a police composite of Mr. Cruel, an Australian serial rapist and suspected murderer who terrorized young girls throughout Melbourne, Australia in the late 80s and early 90s. Mr. Cruel, while on the run to this day, was a meticulous planner and made sure to discard any and all forensic evidence at the crime scenes before darting off into the darkness of the night after committing his heinous crimes towards adolescence. While accused of sexually assaulting three young girls in their homes from 1987 to 1990, Mr. Cruel is said to have caused the murder of Carmine Chain, who attended the same school as Mr. Cruel's previous of the three victims. As many as 27,000 people have been interrogated in relation to the case, but to no avail as of yet. The case of Mr. Cruel remains an unsolved one. This is another composite sketch of a home invader though little is known in the way of details. In another facial composite, this time depicting the Baton Rouge killer which murdered seven women in Baton Rouge, Louisiana between 1992 and 2003, the eyes are freakishly exaggerated as if on the cusp of popping out of his head. Aside from criminal investigations, however, forensic facial reconstruction has also been utilized for historical purposes, as the faces of even prominent historical figures have been recreated using the forensic method. Maximilien Robespierre, an icon of the French Revolution, had his very own facial reconstruction makeover, as did Nibiri, an ancient Egyptian noble figure who had died of heart disease over 3,000 years ago. But overall, according to the FBI and the Department of Justice of the United States, a staggering number of 40,000 human remains collected from crime scenes and other means pertaining to criminal cases open and closed have yet to be identified. Forensic facial reconstruction and police composites, however, have generated major breakthroughs in a whole catalog of cases. In addition, victims and even criminal perpetrators are periodically getting identified more frequently, allowing for greater chances of families finally being allowed to rest as it has become easier than ever to find answers and to solve even the most depraved of crimes. Whether solved or unsolved, the haunting, unnerving, and purposefully disturbing forensic facial reconstructions have often been proven to be a useful tool. Yet in the dark world of homicides and the unsolved, it seems there will always be more questions than answers. <laughs>